In today's video, I'd like to talk about my DIY liquid nitrogen generator. This is a project that I built in 2008 and showed at Maker Faire 2010, uh, where Jerry Ellsworth made a video about it, and I'll put a link in the description. But I actually haven't talked about this in a video myself. So I dusted the parts off and we'll try to make some liquid nitrogen today. The parts from left to right are a laptop to control the whole system, a circuit board to control the cryo cooler along with a bench power supply, and then we have the cryo cooler itself sitting on top of a stainless steel thermos in front of a much larger thermos called a Duar uh, with the Lindy sticker on it. Then the black tank is a nitrogen gas storage tank, a black compressor pulled out of an air conditioner next to that, and then an air dryer and nitrogen separator device. So let's start on the right side and we'll talk about the nitrogen generation system. The purpose of the components that you can see here is just to generate a dry nitrogen gas source. So you could actually replace all of these parts with just a cylinder of nitrogen. However, uh, there's quite an expansion ratio. To, to make one liter of liquid nitrogen, it takes approximately 700 liters of uh, dry nitrogen gas at atmospheric conditions. So if you tried to make this liquid nitrogen generator by going down to the welding store, just getting tanks of nitrogen, uh, you'd end up spending much more for the nitrogen gas. So anyway, the purpose of all this is to take uh, air, just plain old atmospheric air, compress it and filter it uh, and dry it so that we have a source of dry nitrogen. So we start here with this compressor. And uh, the reason I didn't use my shop compressor is because this system has to run day and night and I didn't want the compressor to be noisy running at night. So these compressors are super quiet. This came out of a, a small air conditioner or maybe a refrigerator. And the inlet is here. So it's just got a filter just to you know, filter out large dust particles. And then the high pressure air, which is wet and then uh, filled with oil as well from the compressor comes out here and goes through this setup. So there's a pressure release valve. Uh, since this compressor doesn't have, um, it's not easy to turn it on and off. And so if it's under pressure, it doesn't like to start. So what I did is I had a spring-loaded relief valve just to keep the pressure constant going into this whole system. It's probably about 100 PSI or 120 or something like that. Uh, the first stage is just to get out a lot of water and oil mist here. And then there's a regulator to step it down to something, you know, 80, 80 PSI or something just to, to get a constant pressure from there. And then the uh, semi-dry and semi-wet 80 PSI air goes into this whole setup. And even though it looks complicated, it's really just a bunch of filters over and over again. So there's a, an oil coalescing filter. Um, and then these I've actually packed with carbon to try to get more of the oil mist out. And the cylinders in the back are filled with silica gel to dry the air. So this was kind of a welding project. And, um, you know, I, I had some, I learned how to do a, an O-ring gland on the mill and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of these projects just involve building things to practice building things. I'm sure I could have bought a commercial air dryer uh, for much cheaper and, and quicker, but you know, then you don't learn anything. Um, the one thing I did learn uh, is that it's, it doesn't actually get the air very dry with just silica gel. So to get really, really dry air, you either need a special drying membrane or a cryogenic um, freezer, which you need liquid nitrogen for, so that doesn't really work that well. Anyway, after going through this uh, convoluted path of filters, we go through an indicator uh, glass. So this has silica gel with a, uh, an indicator that turns pink when it's exhausted. And as you can see, it's completely pink now because this thing has been sitting on the shelf for a while. Um, this would let me know if I needed to open this up and recharge the silica gel that's inside there. And you can recharge it just by putting it in the oven uh, to drive off the moisture. And then, it, you know, it acts like a moisture sponge. Following this, we go through the actual nitrogen separation membrane. And so this is a really tricky part of the whole system. I probably spent as long on eBay looking for a nitrogen separation membrane as I did looking for the cryo cooler, which is kind of the heart of this whole system. Uh, you can find these industrially and they're actually quite large. I mean like, you know, a four foot long bundle that's maybe six inches in diameter uh, meant for industrial use. But finding them small like this is, is tricky. And the way it works is that, uh, you know, 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen air goes in at high pressure on one side. And as the air molecules drift through the tubes, the oxygen tends to diffuse through the tube, whereas the nitrogen does not. So by the time you get to the other side, the uh, gas that's coming out the end of the tubes is nitrogen enriched, and the stuff that comes out the side of the tubes is oxygen enriched. And by playing with the flow rate through this and the pressure differential, you can sort of decide how much nitrogen purity you want. So slower flow rates mean that the oxygen has more time to escape, 
and then you can pick off a higher quality nitrogen stream out the end. And as you can see, to control the flow rate, I have this uh, you know, needle valve with a flow meter there just to check uh, exactly how much is going through it. And this was a source of constant difficulty with this uh, system because I had to adjust the needle valve quite, quite uh, regularly. So after all that, the stream of about 80 PSI, almost all nitrogen and hopefully pretty dry, comes out here and goes into the tank for storage. So this, this part is just a buffer. This tank probably could have been quite a bit smaller, but it, it made the job easier um, so I could adjust the flow rate up and down and I'd have a big buffer of nitrogen here so I don't have to worry too much. And then the idea is that the vessel in which the liquid nitrogen is being created, you know, i.e. the nitrogen is being condensed into a liquid, uh, you want there to be a slight positive pressure of nitrogen gas in there. So if there's a, a slight leak, it doesn't pull in atmospheric air. We'll talk about this later. But basically it's controlled by a pressure valve, and this is set to something very low, like maybe half a PSI above atmospheric. And this is connected to the vessel in which the liquid, nitri uh, liquid faction is happening. And then there's a valve here that adds nitrogen gas to the tank. So basically when it's uh, fallen below a half a PSI or something, the valve opens and it sends nitrogen into the tank. And then when it gets up to a half PSI, it shuts off. So this whole thing is really just a dry nitrogen gas regulating system. The heart of the whole system is this Stirling Cycle Cryo Cooler. Basically, it's just a refrigerator that's designed to pump heat across a very high temperature differential. So I'll take this out in a minute, but you'll see that the tip of this device can get down to, you know, 75 degrees Kelvin, and the rejection temperature can be about room temperature, even a little bit above. Normally, I would have this thing positioned onto the large doer so that as the liquid nitrogen is created on the tip of this, because it's so cold, it'll just drip down and fill up this large doer. Um, for today's demo, I'm just going to use this smaller thermos. Um, the cryo cooler is driven by this electronics board. This was part of a, a superconducting RF filter. So this was a piece of equipment designed to be installed in cell phone base stations. And the RF filter is superconducting, and so you have to get it down to liquid nitrogen temperatures uh, to use a high, a high temperature superconductor. So the whole thing was marketed as this uh, device that you could install in your cell phone tower and uh, it included all the self-monitoring. It was completely self-contained, didn't require water cooling or anything. In this case, I've replaced the fins and the fan that used to be on this for air cooling with the tubes that are going to my water chiller. So now it's a water-cooled device. I'm using a benchtop power supply to power it. Since this is a telco piece of equipment, it uses like a 27 or 28 volt standard. So I'm giving it you know, about 28 volts there, just about a little under. And it's currently idling, so it's only drawing you know, 40 milliamps or something. When I turn it on via computer control, we'll see it starts drawing quite a bit more. This particular uh, cryo cooler is rated at 140 watts continuous input power. And I think you get about 7 to 10 watts of pumping of power being pumped from 77 Kelvin up to room temperature. However, you can overdrive it. And so since I have the control software installed on my computer, we're talking to the circuit board over a serial link, I can download new firmware parameters to it and get the power up to maybe about 160, 165 watts. And uh, it seems more than happy to run at that power level as well, especially with the water cooling. This Stirling Cycle Cryo Cooler works on the principle that if you compress a gas, it gets warm, and if you expand the gas, it gets cold. So what it does is it moves ga working gas, which is helium in this case, down to the tip of the device where it expands it so the tip gets cold, and then it moves that chunk of gas back up to here and compresses it so it gets warm. So the, we can see the water cooling lines here are where the heat is rejected, and the tip here is where it gets cold. And it's called Stirling Cycle because it has two pistons inside here. One piston moves the gas back and forth, the displacer, so when the displacer is down at the tip here, there's no gas or there's very little gas here. It's all contained here. And when the displacer moves back up, the gas is forced back to here. Then there's another piston up here, which is driven by these coils. It's basically a linear motor. And when that piston moves, it changes the pressure depending, you know, where the gas is. So it's relatively, or it's, it's being compressed here and expanded here. So we get heat pumped. When I had the cryo cooler installed in the large doer, I added this large heat sink with a copper uh, sort of a heat bar there and had this screwed to the end of the uh, cryo cooler. And my thinking was that, well, I want to make sure that this thing is interfaced temp you know, temperature wise with the uh, gas that's in the doer. I'm not sure it made a huge difference or not, but um, 
I, I'm not going to use this today. What I'm going to do instead of setting the whole system up is just put this into the thermos. This is a, a vacuum flask with a nice large opening on the top. I'm just going to put this on here and run it. And what will happen is the tip will get really cold and the thermos will keep the air from uh, forming too much ice on here. And eventually the entire system will get cold enough to start liquefying nitrogen out of the air. Since I'm not going to use the nitrogen filter, we're also going to be liquefying oxygen out of the air. So the, the result we'll have is uh, liquid air, basically. Okay, I'm going to send the command to start the cooldown sequence. And you can see that we're drawing power now. And uh, I'm going to zoom in here so you can see ice crystals starting to form. Uh, the way the system works is it has to ramp up power very slowly. If it went to full power right away, the piston inside here would actually hit its limits if the tip isn't cold because the gas pressure is still relatively high there. We're currently running at about 60 watts input power, and originally the device had temperature sensors on the cold end of the cryocooler, and it would use this information to figure out how much power it could pump in uh, without breaking the cryocooler. As I mentioned, it can't go to full power right away when the device is warm. So unfortunately the uh, temperature sensors broke, or they were very difficult to remove, and I, I had them off, and then they were working, and then they broke, but anyway. So I've replaced the temperature sensors with fixed resistors, and now I just edit the power settings manually. The cryocooler has this passive spring-loaded counterbalance on the back. Since inside the cryocooler there's a piston that's moving up and forth, the whole thing would shake wildly if it uh, didn't have a counterbalance. So there's a spring-loaded uh, set of weights up here, really just washers, and the weights are set up, you can even see they marked at 60.5 hertz to absorb that frequency being generated by the piston inside. So I thought I'd play with the camera shutter so we can see what this thing looks like uh, sort of going in and out of phase with the camera's uh, sync rate. Okay, we've only been running for about 20 minutes here. We've got the power cranked up to 150 watts input power. And we're looking down into the duar there, and what you're seeing dripping off is the liquid air. So it's covered in snow. That's the tip of the cryocooler that's very cold. But you'll see every once in a while a, a drop comes off, and that's a mixture of liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen. And it's hitting the bottom of the flask and hopefully being collected. So let me zoom out here, and you can see kind of the whole setup. And right now there's no filtering going on, so it's going to get very snowy in there because the air has a lot of water in it and it's currently just pulling in atmospheric air through these open ports. Here's an information screen from the control software showing the current state of the board. As you can see, it's running at right about 150 watts, and the uh, cryocooler itself requires 15 volts RMS at about 10 amps. Uh, but the measurement system is pretty cool. It even shows the phase angle and the RMS total current, uh, you know, including the imaginary part. The PWM drive is running pretty close to 100%. You can actually squeeze a little bit more out of it by increasing the input voltage, and so the software compensates for the total uh, you know, rail voltage that's generated from the input, and uh, will actually back the PWM duty cycle down as you give it more input voltage up to a point. Okay, it's been about an hour, and so I lifted the cryocooler out of the duar, and you can see before the tip has time to warm up, there's still liquid air dripping off the tip and falling down into the doer, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to pour the liquid air out into a styrofoam cup so that we can get a look at it uh, and verify that it's actually air. I'm going to dip this green LED into the liquid nitrogen to show that the cold temperatures change the physical nature of the semiconductor. As you can see, it went out, but as it warms up, you'll see that it starts off orange, and uh, as it warms up, it'll turn back to green slowly. To show that this is a mix of liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen, I'm going to put a very strong neodymium magnet uh, near the surface of the liquid. And since oxygen is paramagnetic, it's actually going to leap out of the uh, styrofoam container and pull up to the magnet. See that? So I'll let the magnet boil off everything that's stuck to it. And we'll just, I'm not actually touching the liquid. I'm still a few millimeters above the surface. You'll see it shoot up the magnet like that. The oxygen content is not that high because it's, uh, you can tell that the color of the uh, liquid is not that blue. If this were 50% or higher liquid oxygen, you would definitely see a blue tint to the liquid. Okay, see you next time. Bye.